Hey, Sleepy Shoopy here. Today we're going to be looking at a level 100 poison and lightning dexterity build. It's going to be at level 100, and this is going to involve a couple different weapons. So the Zweihander is going to be kind of the focal point, but we're also going to be able to switch over to the Nabakiba. And then we have some other poison-based weapons like Venomous Fang and Serpent Bone Blade as well as a lightning scythe. So this is gonna be kind of a mix of different dexterity weapons on a poison lightning hybrid build. You'll note the coil shield, which we're gonna use for very quick poison procs. I really like using this as just a way to get early deadly poison into the mix. And to complement this, we'll be using the mushroom crown as well as kindred rot's exaltation. Those two things will both boost our AR once we proc the poison. And we'll also have some poison bone darts as well as poison stone clumps, just as some extra projectiles if the coil snake doesn't. Um, proc the poison immediately, but in most cases I'll find that just a single hit with the coil shield is enough to proc poison. The rest of the setup is going to involve making our build pretty tanky, so we'll use the tree sentinel armor as well as the crucible greaves and gauntlets, and to make this work we'll need the bulgoat talisman, great jars arsenal, and crimson amber medallion plus two, and that'll give us 101 poise, which is a pretty nice breakpoint. Because all of our weapons are lightning infused and we already have decently high dexterity, we're going to use the lightning shrouding tier, and then we'll also have the crimson bubble tier since that pretty much is standard for all my builds. Due to the variety of weapons we're using, the moveset is going to vary quite a bit, but the main strategy here is going to be to get an early poison proc with the coil snake. I find that if somebody rolls twice, you're frequently going to be able to grab that poison proc on the second roll, so if they're very close to you and roll once that can indicate to you that uh, you can start the coil snake wind up and if they roll a second time oftentimes it'll catch them out of that second roll if they're not too far away so the timing for this takes a little while to get down but i found it to be fairly consistent uh, once i kind of knew what to expect from my opponent so as for the rest of the weapons we're going to be uh, trying to get that poison proc early and then start using, you know, crouch pokes are going to be strong. They just got buffed in patch 1.08, so they're a little bit faster now. Um, it's worth noting that the invasion footage is going to be pre 1.08, and the arena footage is going to be obviously after that, so the crouch poke will vary slightly different in the two different sets of the showcase, but it is definitely noticeable to be slightly faster now that we have the new patch. Um, the heavy attacks are also a great way to change that up. So you could crouch into a heavy and that will frequently mess up your opponent's timing. I really like that. Um, the jumping light attack is gonna be very strong. It comes out in a nice wide sweep and then the jumping heavy is pretty good for damage output, but it's, uh, you need to be a little bit more accurate with it. So the jumping light attack I found to be pretty nice, uh, especially because you can delay it too, and it's you know, a good way to get consistent dam damage and mix up your output. Um, so next we have the Nagakiba. This is just a great fast weapon with a lot of range. The running heavy attack is very strong. The running light attack, or the jumping light attack rather, is fantastic for just a, a quick mix-up. It comes out with slightly different timing. The running light attack is also not too bad. So just given the range of this weapon, it's just so solid. And then you have access to the unsheath, which I find to be great. I really enjoy the unsheath heavy, but you also have access to the unsheath light, and it's you know very strong. Also, I did want to mention as well that we do have uh, the stamp uppercut on the Zweihander. And I found that to be a great way to surprise your opponent. Uh, you can't use it too often, but if you get them to close to half health and notice that they're pretty aggressive, uh, something like, you know, dual curve swords where they just kind of run in, you'll be able to tank everything other than a, like, poison, or a status proc, rather, so like a frost proc or a bleed proc, that will definitely stance break you out of that initial part. But for most other things, you'll be able to just kind of poise whatever is coming at you and then if they continue attacking you'll usually be able to grab the uppercut part which does a ton of damage so if you can land that especially after you've gotten a poison proc you'll be in good shape and then we also have the reaper on here um, this is just kind of a way to mix things up and it also has phantom slash on it so in some cases that'll be really nice as a way to just kind of send some damage out towards your opponent and they won't be able to really do much. You can also change the direction. So if you just want to send that phantom out, you can pull back on your left analog stick and that will ensure 
that you go in the opposite direction of your projectile. So that can be a nice way to uh, be aggressive and defensive kind of in the same moment. That pretty much covers everything that I wanted to say about the build, the move set, and the strategy. And I also want to mention, if you wouldn't mind considering subscribing if you haven't already, that would be amazing. And that's all I got, so let's jump into the arenas and invasions. All right, so jumping into our first arena battle, we have a duel where I'm using the Zweihander and the Coil Shield against a Straight Sword user. And this player is pretty solid. They have the little logo that means that they've won a lot of duels next to their name, and they're using a very meta setup. So I just wanted to include this mostly because it shows that um, this build can actually be viable uh, for duels against you know people that know what they're doing. So that's the only duel that I had. Uh, next up, we're gonna be jumping into the first of two free-for-alls. So this first free-for-all I thought was just kind of a nice showcase of this build as a whole. Uh, we'll do some weapon swapping and we definitely will kind of talk about the strategies that come into play when dealing with free-for-all. So, Early on, we have this mage that's doing just a ton of damage with one of their spells, and I feel like I need to kind of stay on them and kind of just have pinpointed them as somebody I need to be worried about. We have a lot of other melee users, but this person's able to very quickly do uh, about a third of my health, and they're also pretty easily able to take out other players who are low on health. So when it comes to free-for-all strategy, I think it's important to be able to kind of figure out who your biggest threats are pretty early on and also figure out where you're going to find some easy kills along the way. So keeping your eye on other opponents and just being sure that you're aware of when another opponent is low, uh, if you can, you know, kind of run by and grab that kill, that's going to be really useful and somebody else has used resources to kind of whittle them down. So you're kind of taking advantage of it from that perspective. Uh, that said, like, I'm not a huge fan of just kind of staying back the entire time and, you know, waiting for an opportune moment to come in with, like, a jumping attack with two, you know, Colossal Swords or something. Um, that approach can be kind of frustrating to play against. Uh, it's usually fairly successful, and the only way that I've found to really counter it is to kind of stay on that person, but if they're playing really passively against you, then it's like you're not going to be able to get kills, neither will they, but in the end you're both going to lose. So um, I think it's important to kind of find a mix of both aggression and passiveness. Um, you know, you want to be able to take on other opponents while you're getting, you know, kills of your own while also finding, you know, weak links that you can grab a quick kill from. So. Uh, the duration of this duel, I thought it was important to really just kind of mix up my approaches, try to, you know, attack everybody uh, a decent amount, but also really just be aware of this wizard that was, you know, able to kind of like one or like more like two or three shot people with their spells. So, uh, you know, you can see that they are tied with me in terms of number of kills. So, uh, for me, it's just pretty important to, you know, if I want to win this free for all, I, I think making sure that they die as often as possible is going to be pretty helpful. So here I'm able to land a Ash of War on them with the Unsheath Heavy Attack, and that ends up being pretty helpful, and they're, you know, somebody else is using Lightning to get quick kills off as well. So that's also an effective strategy. I think we'll probably see more projectile use in free-for-alls in general. It's, uh, you know, it's pretty strong. So here I think they went AFK for a second, but I wasn't really going to, uh, you know, let them get that. Uh, I thought it would be nice to kind of give them the load screen in between deaths and just kind of keep them off the map for as long as possible. So um, we do end up getting attacked by the straight sword user and this person uh, didn't really appreciate the amount of poise that I had so I was oftentimes able to just kind of poise trade with them and get a couple quick attacks in with the Namakiba and um, eventually they do kind of run off and I, I feel like I need to take my focus towards this person with a sukuku weapon because uh, the bleed buildup that they'll be able to send my way is going to be uh, potentially an issue. So this is just kind of me adjusting to the threats at hand. And they were really effective with this fully charged heavy attack. They got me twice with it. Uh, but after the second time, I was like, okay, I think uh, they're, you know, I, I felt like I learned from it and was not going to fall for it a third time. So um, I was able to first stay kind of 
uh, back when they went for the fully charged heavy and then the second time used that charging time to my advantage and come in with a jumping light attack which finished them off. Um, and then this mage again was doing a great job of getting kills with their spells that just could do so much damage. Uh, again you see they've caught up to me in terms of number of kills so I stay aggressive on them. Uh, sometimes I do need to shift my focus but the mage was not doing a great job of taking advantage of that in terms of you know killing me in that moment and i think they really should have so i'm not sure if they were out of fp but they've switched to just beating me with their staff uh which wasn't a great strategy i'm not sure what that was about but we are you know at nine kills and close to done uh with this arena here so i'm able to get one more quick chase down and i start going for this person in the full radon armor and I'm able to get a Ash of War off on them and get another quick slash in. So uh, this arena, I didn't end up dying. Uh, it was a nice mix of back and forth in terms of uh, who is in first place. And every time you get the first place position in free for all, you get all of your uh, health and FP replenished. So that was really useful, but it's not always practical to kind of have that back and forth between first place and not first place, which can kind of keep you alive for the duration. So this next one is going to be focused solely on the Zweihander, um, whereas the last one was the Nabakiba. And this one, I, I definitely died a few times. There were uh, some more kind of threatening Ashes of War involved. So uh, someone with the Blasphemous Blade was using that pretty effectively. That was something I found quite frequently in the free for -alls. Uh, was just very effective use of Blasphemous Blade where it takes up a ton of space and does a ton of damage. So that and the Ruins Greatsword I imagine are going to be uh, something to really look out for. If you can kind of back yourself into a corner and get that Ash of War off, you'll be able to pretty effectively steal kills. I'm not sure how much I'll end up using that, but it is a strategy to be aware of. Um, we also definitely had a wide range of skills. This person is trying to parry a Colossal Sword, which you can't do. Uh, so that was definitely just, you know, somebody hopping in here who maybe doesn't do too much PvP, doesn't know all the weapons that can and can't be parried. Uh, so that was just kind of some good information to have. Uh, anytime you see somebody trying to parry something that's unparryable, uh, you're probably going to be able to assume that they're um, maybe newer to PvP or just don't have a, a huge time commitment to it, which is totally fine, but it's good information to have. So um, we do have a dual katana user here, and they're going for a lot of jump attacks. I'm, you know, just a little bit late with the crouch poke, so I start switching it up, and then the dual curve sword person starts coming in. And I do manage to land a uh, heavy attack there, which was a nice mix-up from the crouch attack, but the blasphemous blade does get me there, and I'm you know, forced to respawn. So this arena, I don't think, or this free-for-all battle, I should say, didn't start out that strong. I think um, I wasn't doing an amazing job of chase downs, and that's something with Colossal Swords where it, it can be difficult to really uh, effectively chase people down, where, you know, you saw with the Nabakiba, like, the running heavy attack was very, very strong in terms of chasing people down, but you have to be a little bit more intentional with the Zweihander, and I think, you know, your your burst damage is going to be pretty important if you're seeing people who are, you know, close to death. So, um, I, don't, I don't think the Zweihander really lends itself well to the arena, but it's still definitely playable. Uh, you can see here just, you know, a, a couple stun locks with the massive amount of poise damage that the Zweihander does, and I'm able to get a quick kill there, but I don't have too much pressure from everybody else um, and there just a running light attack was something to kind of catch that opponent off guard and everything is kind of reset back to neutral it's just me and this one other person while the other two people are spawning in and there I just get uh, a blasphemous blade to the back which is absolutely a part of the free-for-all arena you can get a little bit focused on the player that you're trying to kill and not take into account some of the other players in the arena so just trying to keep people on screen and have awareness of where everybody else is is going to be uh, an important part of winning these and not getting tunnel vision is also pretty important and you know it, it's something that i think we're all kind of figuring out uh free for all in an arena style is you know new to a lot of us so you know we're just kind of going to be learning together um, but eventually there, I am able to get three pretty quick kills. 
And at this point, one person has disconnected, I believe. So it's just two of us now, or two opponents, rather. Um, and this person is really going for parries. I think they got a little tilted, uh, which meant that I was able to get some quick hits in. And then here I go for my uppercut. And this results in the other player, uh, the one that was going for parries, to also disconnect. Now it's just a one-on-one. -on -one and at this point, the third player does disconnect. So uh, you'll get a different level of interest in the arena and kind of, I don't know, when you have different levels of play style, you might get some, some tilt for sure, but I think it's all just to have fun. Um, I would say taking it too seriously is maybe not the best way to play it. Obviously, um, you know, when there's something that's so outwardly competitive, I think you're gonna have varying degrees of you know, attitudes regarding the kind of competitive nature of that. But, you know, for, for me, it's just like, you're going to die sometimes, you're going to have fun, hopefully. And, you know, if you use builds that are interesting, but still viable, uh, I think it will make the arena a better place for everybody. So next up, we have a 3v1. And here I'm able to kind of poise trade with the stamp uppercut and get a kill pretty early on. I felt like stamp uppercut was one of my favorite Ashes of War I've used so far. I kind of neglected it for a while, but the hyper armor you get at the beginning of it is amazing, and then the amount of the damage you can do with it is also amazing. So I do also get a poison proc pretty early, and that allows me to kind of ramp up the damage that I'm doing, and I accidentally kill the host. Uh, there's such a wide sweep when it comes to the Zweihander that it's really difficult to only hit certain people, so, you know, happy accidents, I guess, but I would have liked to have gotten you know, the full three people. So this next one is a very interesting invasion. Haven't had many of these. It essentially involved uh, a host that was pretty friendly, pretty chill, and just kept summoning in blues and phantoms. And I was kind of just trying to go for a normal invasion here, but eventually we did kind of end up friendly towards each other, and so I was just kind of able to continue my attack on <laughs> pretty much anybody that came into the world. So uh, at this point, I think we've gotten two kills. I come over to visit the host, um, see how they're doing. They're still friendly, they're still cool. So some time does go by, and eventually we do get that phantom from earlier to show up, as well as a blue. So this becomes kind of a normal 2v1 with the host not really interested in the fight. Um, I try to get some frost pots going early as well, and do manage to kind of bait them into this area, and uh, they get hit while they're walking down the stairs. And this is kind of a not a great situation to be using this Vihander. We have a mage kind of staying in the back, and then we have somebody aggressive with claw weapons and bloodhound step, so they can kind of just reaction bloodhound step most of my Zweihander attacks. And I'm going for a little bit more claw, uh, coil shield than I probably should, but I end up getting the proc, which means my AR is now boosted. And I was hoping to get a quick kill with the stamp uppercut, but bloodhound step was a little bit too effective in terms of getting out of that area. Um, I'm definitely trying not to hit the host, and I go for one more stamp uppercut, and I think that wasn't really the play. I think going for some light attacks or a jumping light attack might have been uh, a little bit smarter because you do open yourself up to take more damage while you're in that kind of stamp aspect of the stamp uppercut. So here things are not going great. I really need to kind of back up and almost die there when I'm assuming that I'll poise break the opponent with the claws, but Bloodhound step does give them the iframes to really just ignore that entirely. Uh, here I go for one more stamp uppercut, just really hoping that it might work out and realize that I'm gonna need to change my strategy a little bit. So I bring out the parry shield um, and go for some predictive parries. It's not really effective, but I've also baited my opponents into an area with PPE that hasn't been killed yet. And that ends up taking care of the mage pretty easily. And then on the back swing from this Y hander, I'm able to clip the blue here. So. They're definitely on their back foot now. You can see their level of aggression has absolutely changed. Um, I'm able to get some hits in a little bit more consistently. I think the one-handed light attack has kind of a long hitbox animation, which is helpful for catching the player with Bloodhound Step. And the Venomous Poison is definitely still working in terms of chip damage. Um, so that's, you know, definitely working out. and. I'm able to roll catch them once more with a crouch attack. So uh, I mentioned this earlier, but the crouch attack has been buffed slightly. It is a little bit faster. Um, so those two did go down 
And now we do have a blue that climbs up the ladder. I'm kind of up here waiting for them with unsheath and they quickly go down as well. So, you know, the, the kill count is definitely getting up there. Eventually, um, Dragon Apostle shows up. I'm not sure who this player is, but I did uh, really enjoy fighting them and I saw them in another invasion that we'll see after this one. So I'm able to get the coil shield off pretty early. My AR is now boosted and I'm able to get some, some crouch pokes in and vary that up with some light attacks, um, running light attacks rather. And it's definitely a good way to roll catch people. I think the this delay that comes with the running light attack is, is really nice. You get the wide sweep, which means you have varying timing based on how early or late that sword comes out. So I'm you know definitely wearing down their health and they do manage to get rid of the poison buildup, so um, that's something to be aware of. And I switch over to the Navakiba. Um, I just felt like the Zweihander was, was working all right, but um, we just wanted to kind of vary things up a little bit. And having access to a slightly faster Ash of War, I felt would be a little bit more helpful. So we do have another Phantom that comes into the world as well. Um, here I just kind of botched two freezing pot tosses, but uh, the third time I do manage to get that. So that's gonna be nice in terms of lowering the um, or damage negation for this opponent here, uh, the Dragon Apostle. So um, I don't manage to get too many hits in, but I also successfully dodge a lot of the incoming attacks. I'm trying to keep them in this hallway area because it kind of funnels them uh, into a small area that they're not super easily able to like flank me. And eventually I am able to catch up with that phantom and get a backstab, which was just another nice bit of chip damage on that phantom. So they come in with some lightning and just that takes up the entire area of this court sort of hallway. Um, but I do switch over to coil shield and get a poison proc on the other phantom. Um, so once again, I do have some nice AR boost with the Mushroom Crown and the Kindred Rot Exaltation. And I almost die here just after going for an unsheathed attack, which almost manages to kill the Phantom, but I don't manage to get that. I'm now out of FP, so um, my unsheathed attacks will not really be doing too much. I do go for it here, and it's not a bad way to you know, deliver a decent amount of poise damage, but really uh, you know, to maximize damage output, I should definitely you know, drink some um, FP. So here I managed to get my health back to just about full and uh, replenish my FP. And <laughs> I think we have some appreciation just for the general play style maybe. Um, but going against this Dragon Apostle person was, was definitely a good time. I appreciated their um, use of a great sword. You know, they, they just seemed to have kind of a fun build. They were using the uh, talisman that meant they looked like a host. So. Uh, they were just kind of committed to what they were doing, and I respected that for sure. Um, the other Phantom is not posing too much of a threat. Um, <laughs> the host is kind of doing an interesting job of not totally staying out of the way. I definitely tried not to hit them too often, but um, they weren't like, you know, super far back. And here I'm eventually able to land just a unsheath heavy attack, which takes care of that Phantom. And I switch over to a Reaper. Um, I'm not sure if this was the move, but it you know, ended up working out in the end. So it was just kind of to switch up my, my moveset and do something a little more interesting. And then the Phantom here does also switch over to the Reaper, but I have kind of a fantastic counter to Black Flame Tornado, which is Phantom Slash. So I can send that Phantom inside Black Flame Tornado and not die in the process and manage to get the kill. And then sadly, before any more Phantoms or Blues could come into the world, I had a disconnect. So I believe that was an accident. Um, I, or just, you know, the game. It was a very long invasion involving a lot of different players, so definitely possible. Um, but it didn't, it didn't feel intentional or anything. Um, so here we do have the Dragon Apostle again, and here we're in kind of a, a fun area to fight. Definitely need to be aware of the different um, kind of edges around you and try not to fall off. I do manage to get a poison proc on both players, which is pretty great. And then eventually here I am going for the uppercut and managed to kind of yeet them off the edge, um, which was, you know, kind of exactly what I had hoped for. Um, and then at this point, I think I've just kind of uh, delivered too much intimidation. So the host starts to run. I switched over to the Navakiba because I think if I have any chance of catching them, it'll be with a running heavy, but they do manage to fog wall me before we can finish that out. So. Um, just kind of a, a fun night of invading, for sure. Um, befriending a host like that and 
you know, getting to fight a few different people in a row uh, is just kind of always interesting. So here we have two players that are sending a lot of lightning my way, and when I'm in this area, I really like using the stairs uh, to just kind of discourage magic spam. It really, you know, focuses all the attention on a, a very small area where accidents can happen with the ledge and whatnot. So I start going for some projectiles as this person is using the waterfall dance and the, uh, you know, freezing pots are definitely a good counter to that. You don't have to get all up close and personal. Um, and if they aren't already frostbitten, you're pretty much guaranteed to knock them out of it. It's actually a pretty effective strategy against Melania in general. So. Um, that ends up working out to kind of put some pressure on this opponent, and then I begin the chase down with the dry hander. Um, I think I was going to go for a weapon swap there, but I uh, got stun locked out of it, so I stick with the dry hander, and then this feels like a good opportunity for a jumping attack. So I just land a jumping heavy while they're still in the middle of their waterfall dance animation. So going for attacks with long animations while you're low health is extremely risky. Definitely wouldn't recommend it you can very much get kind of caught by something that you're not expecting, especially if you haven't seen, you know, the Ashes of War that your opponents are using. Like if I had used Phantom Slash there, that would have been a great counter. Um, the freezing pots were also working pretty effectively. So uh, that was kind of, uh, it felt like kind of a hopeful move from my opponent and didn't really consider how I would react to it. And I think that's really important when you know, just playing this game in general is, you know, making the moves that you want to make versus making moves that consider what your opponent might do. And if you're not considering what your opponent might do, you'll frequently get caught kind of on your back foot. Um, so that's something I obviously try to do. There's a ton of variety within this game. Uh, so you can't always know what your opponent is going to do, but just having a good idea and playing defensively in terms of keeping your health high is always going to be useful, especially if you're going for long animation. So eventually a blue does come in and they start going for a decent amount of dragon spells. Um, you know, having Rot Breath be nerfed in one of the earlier patches I think was very welcome. Um, it's not so terrifying as it once was and I'm finally out of range of it. I've also managed to get a decent amount of the Coil Snake Ash of War um, on my opponent, and I found it was actually a decent way to just get some chip damage. They were pretty effectively rolling a lot of the Fly Hander attacks, so um, having the poison, you know, just kind of running the entire time, as well as getting just the raw damage output. Um, another blue does come into the world, so I try to draw everybody over to that blue and then start swinging my sword, which means that I can hit, you know, everybody all at once, and I don't need to just kind of focus on that blue in terms of uh, being stuck in an attack animation with no threat to the host or the active blue. So that's something I recommend when you do see a blue come in is just to try to not focus solely on that or give yourself iframes. So like if you can get a backstab, that's great. Um, you'll have iframes through it and you won't be taking damage, but definitely don't just focus on light attacks that are gonna deplete your stamina and not pose any threat to the you know uh, other opponents within this space so um that ended up being i think the the correct play it's back to just a 2v1 and i've gotten some heals and fp for my for my uh troubles there so now we just kind of continue this dance where we're trying to avoid the uh dual greatsword attacks which can do a ton of damage especially because they have a moonlight greatsword which is um something to worry about for sure they haven't buffed it so i'm not worried about any uh, projectiles coming my way but you know just kind of being aware that it could um, and I am able to get the the chase down there so one thing to note about that blue is that they were running regen so getting the poison proc pretty early to kind of counterbalance the regen they had going was also really helpful uh, it meant that I could kind of play at my own speed and if you know even if the two just canceled out directly uh, I didn't have to worry about kind of all my successful attacks being uh, for naught. So here I am able to land an uppercut and that brings the host very close to death but the chase down is a little bit unsuccessful. The incline is not really conducive to landing the, the running light attacks with the Zweihander because uh, your opponent may you know end up going down the incline and the Zweihander hit box will go over their head. So I switch over to a scythe here and I'm not sure if this was necessary at all, but I did want to include, you know, some of the other weapons within this showcase just because it was kind of a more dexterity lightning 
build with a little bit of variety. And also in the past, I've asked about weapon swapping and people seem to generally be okay with it. Um, you know, I'm not always gonna do showcases that have multiple weapons involved, but in some cases I do want to, you know, have more of a variety and just kind of general build um, that I showcase. So I do switch over to the Serpent Bone Blade. Uh, the range of it are, isn't really doing any favors for me. So I switch back to the Vihander and just kind of begin some, some more attacks. Um, I'm taking probably more trades than I need to, but I've uh, kind of understood that uh, the output of damage that my opponent is doing is is worth it to take um, just based on the amount of damage I can do. So if I can just poise trade with them a few times, I feel like I'm in a fine spot to win. And there I do get two poise trades and then continue to apply pressure. Uh, I manage to get some, some light attacks and switch over to the coil shield. And this ends up being the, the right move because now I don't have to worry about whether or not my Zweihander lands they're close to death and eventually the poison does get them. So uh, a bit of a long invasion there, but just kind of uh, a demonstration of how to approach something that's a bit longer like that. Next up we have a multiple opponent situation where uh, the main player here is light rolling. I do get an early poison proc kind of by accident. I was aiming for the host there that is light rolling and just kind of managed to completely miss them but hit the phantom. And here I go for a kind of a ridiculous chain of just light attacks and then the Ash of War with the Vihander and that ends up being very effective. Uh, I think they got caught by every hit so that was pretty nice. Um, and I switch over to the Naga Kiba and I think that was the play in terms of getting damage on the host there that is light rolling. So this is just gonna be a little bit of a faster approach and it's going to allow me to go for more hits more pre frequently um, rather than my hander. So I managed to get a quick unsheath off and take care of the blue with a little bit of help from the PVE. And the PVE is definitely gonna be a big factor in this invasion. They were kind of everywhere, uh, you know, doing damage to me and doing damage to my opponents as well. And uh, here the host is in kind of a bad spot. They've got, they're kind of stuck in a room with PVE. So I switched over to the Serpent Bone Blade because I felt like the double slash Ash of War was gonna be really good in terms of zoning, uh, just keeping the uh, host from leaving that room pretty effectively. And I, I think it did a good job until a, another Phantom showed up and I needed to kind of change my approach. So I switch over to the Scythe here and start going down after the phantom and they're getting uh <laughs> you know they're having quite a bit of trouble just with the pve uh, honestly this pve can do quite a bit of damage so the host does end up going down as well in the process but i just thought that was kind of fun the the first invasion or the first part of that invasion rather um had a nice demonstration of the Zweihander uppercut, and then I was able to incorporate a lot of different weapons. So at one point I did switch over to Lightning Ram on the Zweihander, and this was a instance where I almost managed to get a kill on the host. They're uh, ganking in kind of a, uh, I don't know, uh, a spot that's not within the spirit of invasions. I, there's not very much space to go anywhere, and there's no PvE, so, you know, using Moonveil or Blasphemous Blade or uh, dual curved bleed swords is you know, uh, not uh, um, the most fun to play against, I would say. So um, the Radon user, or Razan Helm user with uh, Moonveil is is definitely my main target right now, and they're kind of somebody I need to look out for. They've also got Dragon Breath going on, which uh, is definitely pretty useful in terms of keeping me back, and knowing that they do have Moonveil with the, the long projectile associated with it is something to, to worry about as well. I do manage to kind of utilize the poise that I have uh, to get a freezing pot off and stun lock them out of the dragon breath. And I think that was definitely a good play. They are now going to be taking more damage. Um, and I did try to land an unsheath on them, but they managed to moonveil me first. So not perfect timing there. And they do land a couple more moonveils on me and I'm just having a really hard time kind of breaking past their rank. So I switch over to the scythe, which does have phantom slash on it, which is gonna make it a little bit more easy for me to kind of break into this, having that phantom that can take, you know, some of their health away as well as, you know, I don't need to worry about getting hit if the phantom's going forward. So 
uh, definitely a, I think, good play on my part to just kind of see that you know, my strategy wasn't working and switch over to something that might be a little bit more useful. And with the help of Phantom Slash, I'm able to get rid of the Phantom that was really posing the biggest threat. So I switch back over to the Nagakiba and start going for some attacks on the uh, Dual Curve Sword user. And there, I think the timing of the Viper Bite was correct, but the Light Roll kind of was a good counter for it. And there they go for, uh, I think, Bloody Slash, and that was definitely not the play. They had way too little health, and I'm able to kind of more quickly get over to them and just grab that kill with the Nagakiba. So next up we have a 2v1 and we have a lot of aggression right out of the gate with Bike Spear and um, that Faith weapon I'm forgetting the name of at the moment. But uh, I'm able to utilize my iframes to get a quick Viper Bite off and that ends up being enough to uh, get rid of the Phantom with the extra AR and then it just becomes kind of a chase down here. So overall, I would say I really enjoyed this build. I feel like it's actually a pretty strong build and you know, I don't think it's close to meta exactly, but uh, definitely competes with meta much more than some of the other builds that I've had. So uh, I definitely hope you enjoyed this and yeah, that's the last invasion of the showcase. As always, if you made it this far, I just wanted to say thanks so much for watching. Really appreciate everybody's support. I also was curious for some feedback regarding the format. I, you know, wanted to be doing some arena stuff, but I don't want to lose sight of the invasion content that was the main focus of this channel in general. So if you liked kind of the free for all duels and whatnot mixed in with the invasion content, definitely let me know. Uh, if you'd like to just see invasions and you're not really interested in the arena at all, that's also useful information to have. I probably will be doing some arenas uh, just while this is all new and fresh, but obviously I can kind of limit that inclusion. So yeah, thanks so much. That's all I got and I hope you have a good one.